we have major uh, bone loss in this country, over half our population. We are literally crumbling as a nation. And the way you were like tearing the skin off of those guys and chewing it, and you had like a the smile on you, you looked like you were enjoying that. Flesh. I was. But you don't want other people's pets. Then. We don't want to walk into the house and see their dog. You want to see a picture of your dog in that particular house. So it's best to get rid of the animals. If you think only little old ladies get osteoporosis, guess again. Today, Katie Norris, nutritionist to the stars, is here. Her new book and DVD are The Truth About Calcium, telling about the silent epidemic affecting millions of Americans. And later, horror film actress Melissa Bacillar joins us. And then, home inspector John the Rock tells you what to look for when buying a home and what to do when selling so that there aren't any surprises that come back to haunt you later. But first up, Katie Norris. Pleasure to have you here today, Katie. Thank you so much. Great to be here, Greg. So you said there's more of a problem these days with everybody, all ages and genders, having bone fractures, not just the little old ladies that you think That's about. That's exactly right. We have a major uh, bone loss in this country, over half our population. We are literally crumbling as a nation. And it's happening from young little toddlers, 33% increase in bone breaks. And they're breaking like pieces of chalk. And they're terrible bone breaks. They're not fusing back together. We have young girls, 50% increase in the last seven years. Before the show, you were telling me about yeah. an 11-year-old girl. You oh said, yes, right? there's a little 11. We just buried a little 11 and a half-year-old girl who had her bone. She had severe bone loss, and she had leukemia. And in, I felt like they should be charging her parents because she ate horribly, terribly, you know. And I really feel that that's a big problem. And even Time Magazine said that we're going to have see more parents are going to. Uh, I mean, more children will die than even before their parents in the, in the close future here. So it's pretty sad. And we're, what is the cause of this? Is it, is it the nutrition? Well, the, the we're looking at, yeah, we're looking at um, these, these sodas that are leaching us of our calcium and our minerals. Because, you know, where there's minerals, there's life. Where there's no minerals, there's literally no life. And we're getting, having a lot of salt. We're having in the pharmaceutical drugs. We're not getting enough sunshine. Um, we eat foods that are dead foods, acid-forming foods, like meat and dairy and sugars and, and salts, things like that. I shouldn't tell you I have a cannabis, one of those every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so that's off the list. That's right, exactly. But now, when I was looking on some of the websites, they'll mention, they'll say, you know, one of the things for calcium deficiency or, um, you know, fighting osteoporosis, trying to prevent osteoporosis is a glass of not bad milk. But you're right. saying there's a problem with Yes, milk? there is a problem. As a matter of fact, they lead you to believe that it's actually going to build um, your bone mineral density and help build strong bones. But the truth is, is that we're seeing a correlation with people who have the highest rates of osteoporotic fractures are the ones who ingest the most dairy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I still eat my cheese, my organic cheese, and I, I every once in a while, but I never rely on it to build my bones, and neither should anybody else. You know, and there's a lot of other, you know, they're putting hormones in there that are major cancer-causing hormones. So, yeah, exactly. So we really have to, I mean, in other countries, in Europe, they don't put it in there. They, they actually have banned it. So we have to really be um, critical on what we're ingesting and, you know, taking into our bodies. So, But most people are actually, they don't realize that a lot of our supplements that they're taking, they think it's supposed to build strong bones, and they're telling them about all these studies. But the truth is, is they're eating a shell. They're eating, you know, chalk. And, and pebbles. And it, these are natural things, but our bodies can't absorb it. Whereas a plant can go down and pull up those hard inert minerals and create an amazing plant that is so rich in calcium and magnesium. Because it's not just about calcium, it's about t almost 20 different things that we need to build strong bones from calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, boron, selenium, phosphorus, potassium, lysine. You know. So fruits and vegetables can actually be a better source of calcium? They absolutely can. because. They, you know, in 1999, Gunther Blobel won his Nobel Prize for a thing called cofactors. They're only in these foods that, you know, where they know exactly where this, this, this plant here knows exactly where to go. When it, once you, you chew it and digest it, it knows exactly where you may have, maybe your hip is starting to, to go, you know, thin out. It knows exactly where to go and fill that up. Whereas, you think this rock knows what to do? No, it's dumb. I mean, it has no, no. Um, now, how much is, let's say, uh, how does this compare with a glass of milk? How much calcium is in that? Well, that's the great thing. You know, milk is very high in calcium and everything, but it has certain enzymes and proteins that leach the calcium right out of you, and that's one of the biggest challenges with it. So it's not a good source for you. This here, on the other hand, it um, if you get about 100 milligrams, see, there are places in you know the China study, which is the biggest study ever done in, in the world, these people ingested vegetables, fruits, legumes, and grains. They didn't even have, you know, uh, like, 
tablets or they didn't eat meat, they don't eat any of that stuff, and yet their bones and their muscles are strong and, and their teeth are fantastic. They, they're, they don't go through the severe menopause that we have here. It's like a train wreck in this country, you know? But they don't have it. So the thing is, is they found that like three to 500 milligrams from their diet of calcium and all these other minerals literally was enough to b keep your bones strong until, you're, until you pass away. That, I mean, it's amazing. I, I read online that calcium is the mineral that people are the most likely to be deficient in. Right, well think about it. It's literally building your bone structure, your entire framework of your body. That's your foundation. You know, and it's building your teeth. And calcium and all these other minerals that are supporting it are critical for over 350 different metabolic processes. So whether or not your heart's going to regulate, whether you get twitching at night, whether you're achy, whether you um, have little little epileptic little seizure, seizures, or whether you have kidney stones, the, you know, um, there are so many other symptoms that you can't even believe it. But the bottom line is, is that we if we're having all these symptoms and we're taking pills for these things to mask it. And the bottom line is if we just go back to our gardens, we would be able to really make a huge change in our life and we would see it very quickly. So I'm surprised you said that even guys that were having more problems with things like hip fractures, Absolutely. which you said are some of the worst. Yeah, they are the deadliest fractures. As a matter of fact, they say oh, like over 30% of the people who get a hip fracture will die. And you know, hip fracture, interesting. Yeah, as a matter of fact, men will have about 20, um, they'll have more hip fractures than, than even women in the next 20 to 30 years because of the antacids, because of the uh, acid forming foods because they don't eat this kind of stuff. You know, they're now, not is this told about it. Later in life, or is it? Well, it's, guys it's, it's happening. Um, it's happening in younger people too. I mean, we're, by the time you're 50, even for a man, you're gonna you're, the, the chances of having a fracture increases tr dramatically. Um, so it's really you have to look at all that. You, you need weight bearing exercise. You need. Um, to create a lifestyle that's going to help with this, and that's what the Don't book does. Don't eat the rocks, but exercise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the exactly. Fruits and vegetables. Yeah, it's so funny how we think that we can eat a rock, you know, where it's citrate or you know carbonate, carbonate and, and coral calcium and all these different calciums out there. They all come from these rocks, shells, stones, bones, and we think that's going to going to build a strong bone, and it's not. It has no idea what to do in our body. It has no. It only creates a chemical reaction, like a drug. Well, in our final minute, I did want to mention you have a reality TV show coming up. Yes, the, the cures in the kitchen. Cures in the kitchen. Yeah. So what's that yeah. all about? Um, it really, basically, it's a reality TV show of our lives, and Pam Anderson wants to, she's going to be executive producer, Merv Griffin Productions is going to be producing it, and they just said, hey, you guys live this. I mean, we really do. I have a rare blood disease, and I gave it to my kids, and so we have to eat to live. And so we, they follow us around, and they, they, they can't believe it. They, they said, nobody else lives like this, but yet they should be. You know, that's the great thing. He says, I go into your kitchen and I take this cookie and it's like unbelievable, it tastes incredible, but then you tell me it's good for me. Can we eat like this? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, and I'll cross the, whatever that is back there. Yes, yeah, the soda list. off the list, that's right. <laughs> no names, I actually drink both brands, so oh. it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Katie so Norris. Much, the book You're is lovely. The Truth About Calcium, the DVD. Look for her new reality show, The Cures in the Kitchen. We'll be right back. Ever done something you're ashamed of? Something so wrong you couldn't even look at yourself in the mirror. This hunger, it's a sickness, unquenchable. Why'd you do it? I'm hungry. Skinned alive. This is my lucky night. And we are back. Joining me now is actress Melissa Bacillar, the horror queen. Her new films are Skinned Alive and Pink Eye, as well as The Gods of Circumstance. Great to have you here today, Melissa. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I want you to know, I tried to watch, I started to watch Skinned Alive what? last night. <laughs> Why do people always say that? I That's tried to watch. I mean, I was there. Okay, I'm a little bit scared of you. No offense. Oh, well, I'm a little bit scared. You should be. I'm really mean. <laughs> I can tell. No. But, you know, the way you were like, um, how do I say? tearing the skin off of those guys and chewing it, and you had like a the smile scene, on you. You looked like you were enjoying that flesh. I was. The first scene is a lip, I believe. Well, they always say in horror films, a good horror film has to capture their audience in the first five minutes. Okay. So, most five minutes, the first five minutes are gonna be the goriest, and that opening scene of Skin Alive is pretty aggressive. So, it's funny, because I, I, in real life, I don't eat meat or 
anything that is living. So that's good. Actually, you know what? I have never been happier to hear that a guest is a vegetarian. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian, so you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. I only eat people in my movies, so it's only totally movies, okay. fine. Yeah, and it wasn't just that first scene though, because yeah. um, I have, I well, I sort of fast forwarded <laughs> because I was trying to, yeah, and so I was watching. And I thought, oh, and there she goes again. The moment's hungry, you know. And well, I'm so. a zombie hooker in the film, so <laughs> basically instead of sleeping with my Johns, I eat them. You know, both. It's really okay. interesting. You know, the fun thing about being a horror actress is you never know what's going to happen in your scripts. It's fantasy, so you get to well, like, crazy characters. And, and not that there has to be a correlation between the film. And you know, I realize just the actor job side and all of that. But since you, you were producer of this, yes. but you weren't the writer. I was not the writer. So I know it's not based on your life. And no. Your art <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> but what I wanted to know though was how the special effects though. Um, what was that like? Because you, know, you were just like pulling the skin off these guys. You know so, what's uh, really funny? I, when I watch horror films, I watch them like through my fingers. I, I get totally freaked out and my friends will be watching them with me. They're like, Melissa, you were there. You know it's not real. Why are you so freaked out? It looks so much crazier when there's music and the sound effects and all that, you know. Yeah, even when you know how they did it. I mean, oh, absolutely. And even, I mean, you can sit there saying, oh, it's just a movie, but I still, I still cringe if it's yeah, something really Yeah, crazy boring. things happen in real life, so it's totally yeah. freaky. <laughs> like, oh, that was on the news last night. <laughs> exactly, so, I mean, it's, it's strange with the special effects. Usually, the thing, especially with low-budget films, my thing, the way I get through those scenes is I only want to do it once because I have mm -hmm. rubber and corn syrup and all kinds of gross stuff in my mouth, like eating somebody. I don't want to do So you really didn't over. enjoy that as much as Oh God, no. Life. No, not at all. It was pretty what gross. What were you eating? Um, it's, they don't use any real meat or anything. I mean, it's, no, it's just yeah. stuff. Not human I mean, flesh. It's not human flesh, not totally not. <laughs> it's just rubber and Rubber. Whatever. I mean, I don't even, silicone, I don't know. And I don't did know you do that in one take or was it a few takes? Um, that opening scene, yeah, we had no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you will shoot everything up until that that effect, but um, you usually try to do the effect in one take because it takes a long time to get a prosthetic on somebody. Like that opening scene, I do it tears rip, jaw. It tears whole jaw. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it took a while for them to put the prosthetic on, make it look good, and then have it work and have the blood squirting out. Plus, as a woman and as the hooker, I was supposed to kind of, I wasn't like your normal zombie that's gray and gross. I was supposed to look sexy through the whole movie. So if I got fake blood in my hair, we'd have to wash it, blow dry it, curl it again. And oh, okay. You don't want to go through all that. You do your nails, you know. <laughs> do your nails, yeah, you, you know. know. So yeah. People is, yeah. It's dirty work. So. <laughs> and yet there was a little bit of a love story mixed in there. Yes. That was, was very romantic, story. the way you were kind of like... It's the horror film for girls. It's like a chick flick with okay? blood. Okay. So, you know, all these horror fans that are mostly men... <laughs> what does that mean? I was screwed during the trick flick. <laughs> I don't know. You know? Um, there is a love story. It's, it's very touching. It was a great script. I mean, when I read the script, I'd never produced a film before, and my friend who wrote it forwarded me the script, and he's like, you know, read it. I, I want to get it done. And, we don't have the funding for it. And I was like, I want to make this. I love that script. It was a fun movie. It was a fun crew, fun cast. And I just thought it was, everybody that sees it loves it. And Lionsgate picked it yeah, up, which is great. Yeah, this one's distributed by Lionsgate. It's distributed by Lionsgate. You can get it on Xbox. It's the funniest mm -hmm. thing, because people, it's actually funny and not funny all at the same time. I was recently at a funeral. Um, and the funeral director is talking to me. And she's like, you know, we're just chit-chatting. And she's looking at me. She's like, God, you look so familiar. And I don't know why. Are you an actress? Yes, blah, blah, blah. She's like, oh. And then a few minutes later, she starts saying how her and her fiance love horror films. Well, they had rented Figures Skinned Alive. Are. Yeah, funeral director. <laughs> they rented Skinned Alive. You know alive. they have a morbid sense of humor. <laughs> she loved it. So she wasn't squeamish at all. No, you have another one, Pink Eye. <laughs> I have Pink Eye. That was released by... Um, Warner Home Video, and you can get it on Amazon. Of... Sort of. I play a victim in this one. Oh, a victim. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm kidnapped. It's a masked killer, and he gets out of a insane asylum, and he kidnaps me and keeps me hostage. And it's it's a pretty it's it was a much more um, it was a psychological thriller as mm -hmm. compared to Skinned Alive, which is a little bit more gory and slasher. Just saw kind of movie where it's all exactly. The blood's in your face, the buckets of blood. Exactly. And now for Pink Eye, were you also, you were a producer? I produced that movie as well, yeah. 
Um, and also, I should mention um, God's a Circumstance. Since right. we've had John Schneider and Brian Krauss on the show, I, I know you were in that. So, yes. Small World there. And I play a hooker in that too. There's kind of like <laughs> this thing hookers, strippers, porn stars. That's yeah, what I killers, play. Yeah, you know. You know, it's uh, fine. <laughs> but you said you're going, you want to be an action. Oh, well, I do like action. I love comedy. Um, I've done a lot of comedy more on TV than in my film work at this you point. You said in, in film, they tend to cast you as the, what do you say, the... Um, the, the hooker, the, the stripper, hooker, the porn yeah, star. Yeah. But then on TV, you're I'm, more... Well, actually, I'm the hookers and the porn stars on TV, too, but oh. they're the over-the-top funny hookers and porn funny, stars. Funny, okay. So it's okay. Um, I just did a TV show that Cheryl Hines produced with John Cho, who's my, my leading man, and, and we I played a porn star named Scarlett Joe Ramson. It's very funny. And, um, you know, it's over-the-top comedy, but for some reason, my theater degree just really is great because I get to play porn stars and hookers, so. But what are you gonna do? You can only play what you look like on TV. That's what a very good casting director told me once, and I'm like, well, it's kind of a compliment. Well, and speaking of casting directors, <laughs> we're running out of time, but I did want to mention, um, there's, you know, besides the producer or actress side of you, um, you've really made your own opportunities with your company. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I moved to LA and I needed something to do and I started hiring casting directors to meet actors. And I've been doing that for the past four years. And I have two companies, the Network Studio, which is here in Los Angeles, and in New York. And actors can actually come and meet the casting people and work with them and learn how to audition for their TV shows and films. Or people can do it online at theactorsource.com. And it's the same thing. It's all online workshopping and you get to actually directly talk to the casting people, kind of figure out where you need to be in your career. And so, and you said you've met, well, I mean, literally, you've met probably hundreds of casting directors. Hundreds. Every casting director, every TV show, every film. I mean, they all do these workshops now because they need to find actors. And it was all, you, you know, I imagine partly of that, you also, um, besides the movies you produced, you've got, what, two pilots that you're working on? Two pilots. Um, I'm pitching something right now, actually. You know, I think once you get into the business end of the business, you really start to create things for yourself. I audition all the time. I work on TV and film all the time from the casting people that I meet, but I'm also producing and creating a lot of stuff, which is great. Well, thank you very much, Melissa so Bastelar. We'll look for Pink Eye and Skin Alive and... <laughs> all the other gory stuff that I have going on. <laughs> God's a circumstance. We'll be, we'll be right back. And we are back. Joining me now is John LaRocca. He's president of LaRocca Inspection Associates, which performs more home inspections than any other company in California. He's going to tell you what to look for when buying a home and what you need to do when selling to make sure there aren't any problems later on that come back to haunt you. Great to have you here today, John. Thanks. Good to be here. Appreciate it. So it's not a good idea to hide things when you're selling. Is that right? Not a good idea. Actually, what happens is in, in California, you're required to do a disclosure as a seller so that you disclose the things that you know that are wrong with the property. If you don't do that, well then you're in violation of the California law. But it happens? It happens. And as a result, you say so that sometimes that a home will be an escrow, but it'll fall out of escrow because problems... Well, what happens is people get into escrow and then the buyer will come along with a home inspector. The home inspector will find some things that are wrong with the property. Mm -hmm. They'll try to negotiate that situation to bring the price down again right. to get concessions in some way, either money off the deal or money left to the escrow to fix it or whatever. And uh, if they don't agree or somehow things just don't seem to work out, it falls out of escrow and the seller has to put his property back onto the market. And you said that's a problem these days because with the market down so much anyway. Well, you could imagine what happens in this market. There are a lot more sellers than there are buyers. So when you get into escrow with somebody, you now have taken your house effectively off the market and you're turning away any new buyers that might come along, those valuable buyers that there aren't that many of. And you have now taken off the market and if you are in a situation where you're in a deal with somebody who you can't negotiate or work out the deal with and you end up out of escrow, you're back on the market again and you're looking for new buyers. So you, sh you say what you should do is a, a pre-listing inspection of the home to, to find out, your, as a seller, to find out what the issues are there. Exactly. The safest thing to do is to do a property inspection so that the seller understands what they've got as a property. Let's say, for example, you do a property inspection as a seller, you own a property, and you say you get an inspection. That inspection turns up a deteriorated roof. Well, 
it's better to disclose that right up front to any prospective buyer that there is a problem with the roof and you should know that when you make your offer so that when we get into escrow, we're not going to renegotiate the problem that you're going to find that the roof is deteriorating. Right, because they're going to take money off of the price exactly. or the deal can fall apart. Exactly. So this way, if you disclose it right up front, you tell them to make their offer based on that information, unless this new property inspector will come along, because you want your buyer to get their own property inspector. When he comes along and, and says there's a problem with the roof, the seller can just say, I told you about the roof, we're not going to renegotiate that. Well, I always think it's interesting that people tend to fix up their houses before they sell them, but I was thinking, you know, why didn't they do that when they were living there? But you, you still recommend, though, that people, there are some things people should do to get their homes ready for sale? That... Well, of course. I mean, it's always best to take care of property as you go along, because you're going to pay either a little bit along the way, or you can pay all at once at the end to get things ready to sell. Right. Because, well. you know, I mean, they'll paint the house and redecorate <laughs> everything, and, you know. <laughs> I mean, at the very end. Yeah, 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 you get everything all ready to go, and then it looks great, but then you well, why am I leaving? It looks terrific. <laughs> so you might as well enjoy it while you've got it and take care of it along the way. You know, get things serviced, maintain the paint, and whatever other, you know, things that wear out as you go along. So it's better to do that. But I've heard anecdotally, or I don't know if there have been studies too, that it makes a big difference with the, the sale price. As you said, not only because people want money off, but for even something simple like painting the house. Mm -hmm. I think the real estate agent told me once you can get like something like ten thousand dollars more for the house, you know, by painting it versus just saying, okay, well the house needs a coat of paint, just take it off the price. But psychologically, that does something, and people more than take the cost. If they don't just say, oh, it's a thousand bucks to paint the house, they'll take ten thousand off the price, or you know, that kind of a thing. And it's not just the price either, by the way. It also is whether or not a person driving by that property is even going to be attracted to come into it. Mm -hmm. Because if they see a rundown piece of property that needs paint, they're already getting the idea that this property has not been very well maintained. If you maintain the property, if you paint it, make it look really nice, it's going to attract more buyers, more people who are going to at least be interested in looking at this property, and it will show better, and it's very likely it will get you a lot more money than you pay for the paint. So what are the common things that come up during home inspections that you know you see when your company's out? You do more of these than anybody. What do you, what do you what are the common things that come up? <laughs> Well, the number one problem we see is drainage. Drainage issues are the biggest problem. So people have problems with foundations, cracks in plaster, and settlement floors that are uneven. It's all related to poor drainage. And unfortunately, in Southern California, it doesn't rain that much. So people don't think yeah, about Yeah, that's why when you said drainage, I thought, well, we don't have any water out of here. Exactly, people don't think about drainage. But it, it rains enough in California to cause problems with the foundation or any area where they're trying to support something like a retaining wall or something like that, where when you have uh, occasional rains, but heavy rains, it does soften that foundation system area and it does allow it to settle and sink and then crack and deteriorate. And if there are problems during escrow, what are the kinds of things that usually cause problems? I mean, you mentioned the roof. I mean, is that also something that comes up a lot or is it just all over the place? Well, roofs. It's not all over the place. Uh, roofs are a common one because roofs are always exposed to the weather, so they're always wearing out. Whether or not you use them or not, they're being, they're being affected by the sun, by the heat, by the cool, by the rain. Uh, a heating system, if you don't use it, will never wear out. So you can have a heating system that's 30 years old. If you don't use your gas and you don't use your heat, it'll be like brand new. So you don't, you don't have that same option with a roof, for example. Foundations as well should last the life of a home, if not, you know, through several buyers or owners, so it really shouldn't be something that should deteriorate or crack. If you don't take care of the, of the, the drainage, then you can have those kinds of issues. But the most common thing we find actually are plumbing problems with regards to, in the middle of negotiations, people tend to have issues with uh, drain lines, sewer lines, water lines. Uh, Something they get ticked off about the plumbing and the yeah, well, we have, deal falls apart. We have a lot of different kinds of plumbing systems in this, in this city, a lot of older iron, uh, water lines that deteriorate and rust, and that's a problem for a lot of homes. And so people will change some of the pipes, they will change all the pipes to newer copper, and that's a, that becomes a bit of an issue sometimes. Well, in our final minute, um, you have some suggestions for people, you know, for ways to get the property ready. What would you advise? Well, if you're going to have a showing, uh, you want to make sure that the property is basically ready to be seen. It should be clean, it should be bright, you know, open the curtains, 
uh, eliminate as many of the odors as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the dogs. Mm -hmm. If you can, take them for a walk to run that couple of hours while you're... But everybody loves pets here. Yeah. But, but not good for someone. But you don't want other people's pets. Then. We don't want to walk into the house and see their dog. You want to see picture your dog in that particular house. So it's best to get rid of the animals. And one of the best suggestions I would do is, is have cookies in the oven <laughs> baking. Thank it you. just makes a house feel so much more homey. And people get that wonderful, you know, aroma as they come in the front door, and I think it's a great, it's a great selling tool. Well, oh, it works for me. Um, we make some cookies for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for home inspections. Well, thank you very much, Sean Morocco, Morocco Home pleasure. Inspections. Also, I'd like to thank Katie Norris and Melissa Bassilar. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time.